Hey guys, if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for a link to my Amazon store, where I've compiled some of the very best items available, including some of my own personal recommendations. Thanks! What is going on YouTube Metal Complex here, and today I've got a little bit of a, a special video for you guys. This is a prototype overview uh, of a knife that um, has not been named yet, and I'm really excited to be a part of this. Check this out. <laughs> this is so cool. So this knife um, was, uh, uh, the, the, the concept is, of this knife came from uh, Blade Banter actually on uh, Instagram. And uh, he is actually the person who, um, as far as I understand, runs our Apex Pass Run group. And so um, I just want to say thank you first off to Blade Banter for a long time ago, um, allowing me to be a part of the Apex Pass Run group. You know, Slicey Dicey sent me the invite, but uh, Blade Banter has, uh, you know, ran that thing and, and it just uh, has really been super helpful uh, and uh, a big part of the growth of the channel. So thank you so much. And uh, he had, uh, you know, mentioned, he said, hey, I have this this prototype I'm trying to, uh, you know, bring bring to life. And, you know, what do you think? And I was like, yeah, the moment that you have a model, please let me look at that because that looks really cool. And if you guys watch the unboxing, I was so excited this is, I've handled a few prototypes and I've shown a few prototypes on the channel, but I got to say, this is the most polished, not, I mean, not just in terms of the blade. I mean, literally like the overall, like this feels very finished to me. Um, and I, I'm so excited about that, but keep in mind, this is a prototype. There probably will be a couple of minor changes before it actually comes to the table. By the way, if you want to get on the mailing this list for this thing, I do have a link right down in the description where you can check out. Uh, his brand, Orion Knives, uh, or I'm sorry, Orion Knives, <laughs> so obviously how yeah, that's pronounced, unless I'm just an idiot, uh, but check that out. Go down there, and if you're interested, you know, just by looking at this, if you're interested, get on the mailing list, or if you want to wait until I talk about this, either way, uh, there will be a link right down in the description. Um, so, the OEM on this knife is going to be QSP, and if you guys, you know, if you're familiar with QSP, then you, you know, you're familiar with them, but if you're not, uh, they created the Puffin, and I, I reviewed uh, the Puffin. They did a bunch of knives, but the one that I really liked was the Puffin. The original one, you know, had an awkward thumb slot, and then they did the Thumb Stud variant, and I loved the Thumb Stud variant. Uh, QSP does excellent, uh, you know, quality manufacturing. They are manufactured, uh, they are manufacturing knives out of China, but they have excellent fit and finish, very similar to uh, Civivi and Bestec and some of the other, um, you know, really nice, uh, you know, budget um, uh, knives that we've seen and all the way up to some of the higher price stuff that we've seen coming out of China. They do excellent work. And so that's really nice to hear that that's where that's coming from. Thank you so much to the uh, gener uh, generous patrons who are supporting me right now. If you'd like to check out my Patreon, there is, of course, a link right down in the description. You're supporting me in the world to me. Um, so let's get a measurement here real quick. Overall length on the unnamed prototype coming in at just shy of 8 inches, about 7.8 inches overall. Blade length coming in at 3 and a quarter, and the cutting edge coming in at just shy of 3 and a quarter, about, about 3 and an eighth. And that's because there is a properly made forward choil. Well, I mean, actually, the choil takes up a large area of the um, where the uh, G10 scales are. And that's something that I really like because he's still, you know, for the blade to handle ratio, he's keeping a ton of that cutting edge while still giving you the utility of that forward choil. This is not a tiny, like kind of iffy, like, well, I'm not really sure if we want it to be a, a sharpening choil or a finger choil. No, this is a full finger choil. <laughs> this is how these should be done. I, if I want to hold it like this, I want to be able to hold it like this. If I want to choke all the way up on that and get the full meat of my finger in there, I want to be able to do it. And he did that. Thank you so much for doing that. It's excellent, right? We see that same type of idea on like the Spider Co. Shaman, where part of it is part, you know, in the scale, part of it is on the blade, right? You can see there that it is unmistakably a forward choil, right? Some people don't like the forward choil, especially on knives like, you know, like the Strider SNG or like the PM2 where they feel like the handle and the combination of the choil in relationship to the blade is just, uh, you know, wonky. But in this case, we have a good ratio of blade to handle, functional blade to handle, right? And he's managed to keep most of it out of the path of the thumb stud. Let me also point out that this has three different means of deployment. It has a flipper tab that works 
just beautifully. Uh, and then he's got the button lock there that makes it excellent. If you wanna, I guess if you wanna do this, you can totally do that. And then he also has thumb studs, which are low, but are still accessible. And you can you do the reverse flick, you can do the thumb flick, right? So yeah, fidget factor is off the charts on this thing. Here's another cool part of this knife. It is running on uh, a multi-row bearing system, and that is very evident in the action. Uh, that is really, really cool. You do not see, and while, while I feel like multi-row bearings are probably something we're going to see more and more and more in uh, the knife world, you know, that's the, the part of the knife world that is, you know, less expensive knives. Um, right now, it's not something that you're getting on a lot of uh, less expensive knives. So that's pretty cool. And we will talk about the target price point of this. I think you guys will be pretty excited. Blade steel on this guy. And I... I don't know if it's going to stay this way, but it's 14C28N, which is a Sandvik steel that is actually made for folding knives. 14C28N has a is an ingot form steel, but it has a very fine grain structure, especially when it's heat treated properly. I don't know anything about the heat treat on this, but I haven't specifically heard anything bad about how QSP uh, heat treats their blades. Uh, 14C28N is super well-rounded. Kershaw uses it. It holds a decent edge for a while. It is stainless. It is reasonably tough and it is very easy to sharpen. This is a user steel. It is absolutely appropriate for this build, uh, this blade geometry, which we're going to talk about, um, and absolutely the price range. I have no problem with 14C28N. I'm happy to see that because everybody does D2, right? Everybody's D2. Civivi uses 9CR18 MOV every now and then. You see the 12C27 every now and then. 14C28N, yeah, absolutely no problem with that. Let's do some size comparisons here real quick. Up against the Ontario RAT Model 1. RAT 1 is coming in at 8.6 inches overall. How about up against the Spyderco PM2, which I just had one second ago and then put down. Oh, here it is. Spyderco PM2 is coming in at 8.3 inches overall. How about up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue? The Ritter Hogue is coming in at eight inches overall. Now you can see here what we have. We still have a unique blade going on in this prototype, but it is similar to the uh, geometry and the idea of the geometry, uh, you know, when it comes to, the, like, compared to the Ritter Hogue is what I'm saying. Um, and that's great because you guys know that Ritter Hogue blade became famous as being the optimal blade choice over the Benchmade Griptilian when Doug Ritter was doing this knife with Benchmade. Um, and of course, he went on to work with Hogue. Um, most people will tell you, as far as like the drop point blade between the, the Griptilian and the Ritter Hogue, um, the, the Ritter Hogue has a better blade shape. The geometry is great uh, in terms of just all around EDC and certainly for cutting performance. And we have a very similar blade shape going on here. Also, you know, kind of, I, I see the Koenig Arius in there. I see the uh, Arno Bernard. Um, I've actually got this knife over here. The Arno Bernard Orca um, has a uh, blade shape that it, it kind of reminds me of that. And um, it's nice. It is a really well done blade. I promise you we'll talk about blade geometry here in a second. Very cool. So how's the action on this guy? Well, as you saw, it is completely and totally full shut and very smooth um, with that, um, that button lock. It does not have a weak detent. You know, something I talked about with the uh, Medford, um, uh, was it the Smooth Criminal? The detent was a little bit weak for having a small flipper tab, right? This doesn't have a, you know, an overly large flipper tab. In fact, I'd say it's fairly small. He's got this area back here where it's kind of, you know, there's a cutout here. So it's not rise, you know, really that much higher up than the spot, than the back of the G10 scales. Um, so it's an unobtrusive flipper tab is what I'm saying, but you can get leverage on it and it is very snappy, right? The detent is great. The leverage is great. Just, just awesome. And like I said, the access to the thumb stud. While the thumb stud is not the optimal means of deployment, it is still very easy to deploy this knife with the thumb stud. Whether you want to do the reverse flick, right forward flick, it's very easy. This is, yeah, fidget factor supreme. This is wonderful. You don't necessarily need three means of deployment on the knife, but you, if you can get them, I mean, I, I say three means, it's technically two, but you can just hold the button and sort of whip it out, right? You don't need that, but if you can get them all on there without creating some sort of, you know, uh, it, it, taking away from the utility of the knife, if you can get them all on there, then yeah, then you just get to enjoy the knife or deploy the knife the way that you want to, or, or you know, fl fidget with it the way that you want to. So that's great. I think that's really, really cool. I have, no, <laughs> I have no complaints about the deployment. I will say this, and he said, you know, point things out that you think need to be polished a little bit. Up here, I would say just 
just knock that down just a little tiny bit right on that corner. That I mean, we've got a you know a blade stock thickness of about 125 thousandths or so, maybe 120 thousandths. So we have kind of a narrow, small flipper tab. And just interacting with this over and over again. I mean, this knife screams to be played with. So the, the very first thing that I did was flip it about a billion times. And I would say right here. And I understand, you know, the design. The idea there is to create kind of a guard if you want to hold it back here. But I think I think this area could be knocked down right on those corners just a little bit. Diagonally this way and that way. And I think it would make for a slightly more pleasant experience. But it's not a deal. If it stays exactly that way, yeah, there are a lot of totally finished knives that have flipper tabs that are substantially less comfortable than that <clears throat> hinder. <coughs> oh, so weird. I got something in my throat. Um, but yeah, uh, that's uh, that would be my my one critique there. Um, so let's go ahead and move on here to the hardware check. We'll get out my handy dandy Wea bit selector and Wea magnetic driver, two items that are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them down in the Amazon store that I referenced at the beginning of every video. Just pull up in the store and look for knife maintenance. I believe the pivot is T8, and yes, that is the case. And then we talked about this. He said, um, man, the, we got a little bit of a glare on that. Let's see if I can, yeah, I think it's it's the reflectivity of the blade. This is a very polished blade. <laughs> um, but uh, I believe the uh, handle screws are T6. And he said, I know, I know, you're the T8 guy. I'm going to see if we can get those changed to T8. Um, so I think these handle screws are T6. It's like I always say, it's not a big deal. I just prefer T8. If he gets them changed to T8, great. If he doesn't, it's not a deal breaker. So no big deal. He's got uh, one pivot screw right here. The show side does not have a head that you can turn unless you have a weird tool for those little holes. And then we have two screws. We got one screw here and one screw here. So it's still very minimal hardware. And I think that's excellent. Other than the T6 screws, that's exactly what I prefer on this type of knife, this sandwich construction type of knife. So that's great. Let's see here. Carry profile. So thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3. Uh, it's a little bit thicker than the Para 3. I honestly thought that it was going to be quite a bit thicker. It's not that thick. I don't think... Initially, I was like, ah, oh, man, maybe maybe, maybe the scale sh should be knocked down. I don't know about that. We have kind of, uh, you know, the, the same deal that Spyderco's got going on. They're, they're blocky, fairly thick G10 scales. Um, it doesn't, some, it doesn't, it's not something that absolutely needs to be done because the chamfering on the edges is all great. You know, I, I suppose, you know, the, the blockiness, the feel of the blockiness could be reduced a little bit by some heavier chamfering. Um, I like, uh, you know, an, a, a, an example of that, you know, is once again on the shaman, which isn't contoured, but we've got massively heavy chamfering. Now, if he does that though, you can see there, we've got some aesthetic, uh, features of the knife that might have some draw taken away this line right down the middle, which is cool. It adds um, a little bit of character to an otherwise very plain scale. So that might kind of mess things up as far as where he's got some of this stuff positioned. It might change, you know, how, you know, the screws set into the scales. Um, so I suppose that's a critique. It's not really, I mean, it, it may not be something he's able to do. And if it can't be changed, it's really just fine because this knife is very comfortable to hang on to. Um, that's going to be most people's first impression when they pick it up is, this is very comfortable. The G10 scales feel a little bit blocky and it's going to feel very similar to Spyderco. But again, the P the Para 3 and PM2 and, and countless other uh, knife models out there that are super popular are utilizing the same type of, you know, the uh, shape on their G10 scales and nobody ever complains about it. So I can't really say that that's that big of a deal. Um, let's talk about uh, height this way up against the Spyderco uh, Para 3 and PM2, once again, two knives that have very awkward carry profiles that nobody ever complains about. You can see their overall length is a little bit shorter than the PM2. It's a little bit longer than the Para 3 in terms of height, even including the flipper tab. Um, we are approaching, let's put the PM2 on top and take a look. PM2 is still taller, definitely. So as far as carry profile goes all the way around, um, if you're used to carrying knives like this, even with the flipper tab, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, on the inside here, let's go ahead. I'll, I'll measure the uh, blade stock thickness for you guys here real quick. So I'm going to guess it's 125 thousandths. That's just 
That's what my guess is. Oh, is it is it less than that? Uh, okay. Ooh, 100 and, it says 180. I'm going to guess it's probably about 120. So it's a little bit thinner than I thought. We do have a, a, a slightly somewhat tall blade grind, and that's nice because you have you know a fairly thin blade stock, and you can see that high grind there allows it to get very... It does get very thin behind the edge. I'll show you guys here in a sec. But other than that, we have G10 scales with, and I missed this, and I had to put a uh, little, uh, you know, I had to put some words in there to explain because I noticed it after the unboxing. There is actually a cartridge liner in there. It's about a three-quarter cartridge liner, which is fine. That adds enough integrity. Uh, I don't like uh, knives like the bug outs um, uh, where it's just like one little tiny chip and the rest of it is hollowed out FRN. Um, I don't mind, especially in this thickness of G10, I think it's got plenty of structural integrity. Um, but I do like that there's a cartridge line in, a liner in there just to add a little bit of rigidity and if for nothing else, just to give you peace of mind, I guess. So that's fine. Um, and then um, overall, I mean, there's just not, it's, it's really not that heavy of a knife. It's gonna come in basically what you guys expect it to come in at, which is about 4.76 ounces. Um, you know, in terms of a 7.8 inch overall knife, we're looking at an eight inch knife here in the Ritter Hogue that comes in very similar at 4.55 ounces. So I just don't have a problem with it. It falls right into that uh, weight range that I uh, have no problem carrying, which is about four to six and a half ounces. If you're used to carrying the Bug Out, the Spyderco Para 3, uh, or other super lightweight knives, this might not be for you. But for most people, it's really not gonna be much different from what you're used to carrying. It's a full-size knife, right? If you live in an area where you can't carry a knife that has a blade length that's like this, you know, or this long, or it's over three inches or whatever, um, then, you know, maybe it won't be your, your cup of tea by default, you know? But for most people, this is a very normal size of knife. I would call it a full-size knife, right? If 7.5 or less is a medium, right? You're talking about like a seven inch to seven and a quarter, I'm sorry, seven to seven and a half inch knife is what I'd call medium. Around an eight inch knife to about an eight and a half inch knife, I call that large. Uh, and then anything over that would be XL. Anything smaller than seven inches would be a small knife. That's kind of where I call that. So this is still about a full size knife to me. The weight is nothing that bothers me at all. Very cool. So. Go ahead and talk about the anatomy here. We have a, in this case, we have a red pivot collar and we have a red backspacer. I believe this is, let's take a look here. Is this, what material is the backspacer? Is it G10 or is it aluminum? I can't tell. In any case, uh, he told me that the pivot collar and the backspacer will actually be interchangeable with different colors for customization. So that's pretty cool. If you're not a fan of the red, right? Then apparently you can get a different color. Um, also, I, I believe, now I don't know this for sure, but I did see a prototype image with carbon fiber. So I don't know if that's something he's considering doing down the road. I could also be mistaken about that because my memory doesn't always serve me perfectly. So blade banter, I'm so sorry if I'm wrong about that. Um, but the uh, interchangeability of those, is that a word? Interchangeability? Whatever. I'm going to make it a word. Um, of the pivot collar and the backspacer, I think is pretty cool. That's nice, people can get the flavor that they want. It's always nice to have more options, so you know that's great. Like I said, um, fit and finish is great. QSP does a great job. Everything seems to fit properly. There's a slot milled out so you can sw switch the uh, pocket clip to the other side. I like the pocket because it allows me um, that feeling of confidence in the pocket clip where it's not gonna move around, especially a pocket clip like this that only has one screw, right? Setting it into the G10 means they're not, there's not going to be play in the pocket clip. I know some people are like, oh, it's so horrible, that little slide. It's not. <laughs> in fact, I almost missed it. I almost didn't notice it, you know, right up until I thought, oh, is, can, you, can you change the pocket clip to the other side? I would rather the design has the option that caters to lefties, right? Uh, than it just not have the slot just for that tiny little aesthetic feature that people will care about for basically... 10 minutes right after they get it and then never care about it again. Uh, it's it's not a large slot. It's a pretty small slot. And uh, most of you know what the eye catches is just the head of the screw. So no big deal. Everything looks great. He's got a little line down here. Um, just to, like I said, just sort of add some character to an otherwise plain uh, scale. But the, the, the scale is great. Let's talk about ergonomics. You can hold it back here and get full uh, a full four finger grip here, and then you can choke up on it, which is just excellent. This is a full choke up knife. Very, 
This knife is one of those knives that feels like ready to be used. There's no part of this that says, look at me, I'm dressy, and this is an element of the knife that has nothing to do with utility. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of nice aesthetic features, but obviously the main, the, you know, the, the main design philosophy here was, let's make a tool. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel like that uh, he was very successful in, in the design here. Look at the polish on this thing. This is wicked. Let me see if I've got a uh, satin finished knife that I always... Yeah, here, let, me, let me get the praxis out here. So, here's the satin finish that I always talk about that's boring to me. This satin finish that's on the praxis is pretty much the same satin finish we see on everything. Right? No matter what price range. This is a much more polished satin finish and it really looks nice. There's a lot of reflectivity in that blade and it's just cool. And it is definitely not something that I see in the price range. You know, in terms of what he told me the target price point on this thing was, that is not something that I see like ever in this price range. So that's really cool. It's really nice. And on top of that, edges knocked down. Very, very nice. Let me give you guys a look there. You can see that little line. They knocked that down a little bit. We've got the Orion symbol up here. And then on the other side, it just says 14C28. And like I said, I don't know if the way the way if that's the extent of the billboarding that's going to be on the blade. But if you leave it just like this, I think that's great. I love how that looks. We've got a high flat that runs about, oh, 75% or so of the blade. Carrying a lot of meaningful thickness down to the tip. What is that? Why is there just debris? Um, the uh, it carries a lot of meaningful thickness down to the tip, so it's a, a robust tip for sure. But man, this drop to the cutting edge. Oh, nice and thin, nice and thin behind the edge. Very, very sharp. The edge feels perfect. That is just wonderful. For those of you who really have a, a you know put a personal emphasis on you know that buttery slicing performance. That blade is built to cut, which is excellent. And here we go with the uh, air. Sorry about that. We're going to get a hum in the background now. But yeah, for the most part, there's really not much in the cutting path. That blade just about splits the difference right there where it starts. So you're going to you know, gain the benefit of, of having most of that edge uh, be fully usable. So that's great. The blade, I wouldn't change a single thing about the blade. The blade is awesome. It's just wonderful. I really, really like that. Um, let's go ahead and move over to this side here. We already talked about the pocket clip. The backspacer looks great. So popsicle uh, stick uh, pocket clips are not my favorite aesthetically. It's 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 one of those things on this design that I'm kind of indifferent about. Functionally, it's just fine. It's easy to get in and out of the pocket with one hand. It's not a pocket clip that really sticks up and is going to snag readily on stuff. And really. While holding it back here, I might feel it just a little bit, not much. Up here, it's just not a problem. It's literally becomes like uh, imperceptible or imperceivable if you're choked up, which is how I would hold this knife anyway. I think this is just, just excellent. Um, the funny thing is, so I like the flipper tab on this thing. I think it's great. Um, I think, uh, you know, another version of this knife without the flipper tab at all um, would actually make, would actually accentuate those ergonomic features even better. Um, because then you wouldn't have to work around it. But the nice thing is, is that that forward choil is so big and there's so much handle room back here that it really doesn't matter that it's there. You know, people who like flippers, you know, yeah, you're going to like this. And if you don't like the flippers, um, then just don't worry about it. Just move your fingers around it. You know, it's it's really, really excellent. Um, let's go ahead and talk about lockup. So this is a plunge lock. Um, this uh, version of it is... Is it perfectly centered? I've been flipping this quite a bit. If it's not centered, it's just ever so slightly off. But I think it's one that, yeah, see, I've been flipping it so much that that screw has probably, so when the screw's on this side, if the screw backs out a little bit, then the blade's gonna move over, it's gonna move over towards the side that you adjust it, right? So that's probably the case. After like a thousand flips on this thing, it's probably the case. In fact, let's go ahead, why not? Let's do it on camera. Let's make an adjustment here real quick. Let's see if we, let's see if we can adjust it. Uh, here, we'll do it on camera. T8. Give it a... Not a free-spinning pivot, so that's not... Yeah, exactly. Came right back to perfectly center, and the action is still completely and totally false. So there you go. That's a good sign of uh, tolerances, a good sign of manufacturing quality, so that's fantastic. No issue there. On top of that, we have 
zero blade play in any direction, which honestly is something that I'd give a slight pass to on a plunge lock because of the nature of it. I've handled so many uh, button locks, right, and automatic knives that have a little bit of up and down play. And because of the nature of how that lock interacts with the tang of the blade, generally I'm like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. I don't like to feel side to side blade play, but on this knife, ha -ha, we got nothing. Nice uh, detent, there is a little teeny tiny bit not much, little teeny tiny bit of detent movement on this prototype. I'm gonna guess the final versions won't have that. Um, I don't know what's all what all is involved with that. If it has to do with the detent ball fitting exactly right within the hole, uh, judging by what I know about um, QSP knives, I've never felt that in a QSP knife. This is a prototype and it is a button lock, so obviously there are a lot of little tiny things to work out um, before the final version is ready. Um, but yeah, that's something that. Not a lot of people even really care about, but it's something that I notice and check for, so it's ever so slight. But the nice thing is, is the detent is tuned properly, that it's gonna flip every single time. Does the slight amount of detent play? And I don't mean like clicky. It's not one where I can shake this thing and hear it clicking, right? That's bad, I don't like that. But does the slight amount of detent play affect uh, the utility of the knife or performance over time? No, it doesn't. It's just something that I don't like to feel. So again, even though I'm focusing on it, rest assured what I mean here, it is ever so slight. It's not anything that I would say is ultra concerning, but I'm going to guess that the final version of this won't have that uh, uh, there. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that's, I think we pretty much covered everything here. Um, Blade Mancer, I don't know what your thoughts are on jimping, but because of how I like to rest my hands on the blade, and he might have his own reasons for not including jimping up there. So this isn't something, you know, this is something that he can say, what, whatever MC, <laughs> I'm gonna do it my way. Um, how I like to, you know, the, where I naturally wanna rest my thumb when I'm choked up is up here. So I do always appreciate a little bit of jimping up there. Not that big of a deal if it's not included because the knife truly doesn't need it. You're so locked in, the ergonomic lines on this thing are so locked in um, that it, it, it truthfully doesn't necessarily need it. So again, Little tiny things. I mean, if I'm being honest and critiquing, uh, you know, the way that I'm supposed to here, that flipper tab gets a little bit pokey, a little bit, just a little bit more knocking down of those corners and making sure that it's comfortable for people who want to flip it over and over again. And by the way, you can totally light switch or put, I mean, however you approach that thing, however you like to put pressure on it, it's going to be fine. It's less pokey if you light switch it for sure, but there are a lot of people, including me, who naturally like to kind of push down on it and then and build up that energy and then fire it, right? Uh, for those people, they're gonna find that that flipper tab is just a little bit pokey, so I think knocking that down a bit or essentially removing what little tiny bit of hook that we have on that uh, is gonna be just fine. Landing zone back here is perfect. I wouldn't change that at all. Blade is absolutely perfect. Um, I, I would like a little bit more chamfering around here, but again, it's not really, the way that it is right now isn't what I'd consider to be flawed. It'll, it'll help knock down that feeling of blockiness, but again, guys, this isn't an overly thick knife. It's just a little bit thicker than the, than the Para uh, 3 and the PM2. I regularly carry knives that are absolutely thicker than this guy, right? Let's actually put it up against the uh, Ritter Hogue. Yeah, so there you go. So the Ritter Hogue is contoured, right? And that definitely gets rid of that blocky feeling. But in terms of thickness of the scales, we are super similar here. And you have to remember, because this is contoured, it actually is thicker than it looks on the ends, right? So there is a rise out to the, the thickest part of the G10. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. But full contouring on a knife like this will definitely add cost. So there might be limitations there because he really is trying to keep it, in my opinion, it's at a very reasonable price point, right? T8 screws would be great, not a necessity. Um, pops, uh, the popsicle stick is not my preference, but it works just fine. It's there's you know no no reason to change it anything like that. I'm gonna say that pivot is not free spinning, which is excellent. The other side didn't move at all, so that's great. Detent lash would be nice to make sure that any hint of it is knocked out. Guys, I don't know that I really have much more to say. What's the target price point on this guy? Uh, he said he's aiming for 80 bucks shipped domestically. I'm 100% on board with that price. That's no, there's nothing to complain about at that price. I honestly thought he was going to say I'm looking at about 120 and I was going to be like, eh, it's okay. No, no, he surprised me at 80. Um, yeah, for, I mean, for what you're getting here, that high polish on the blade, the steel, fidget factor, the fit and finish, the ergonomics especially, that's the, the, uh, 
the cutting, the potential cutting performance, um, the polish on the blade, um, and the uh, the ergonomics on this guy, the choke up position. I mean, this is a user, 100%. He's managed to fit in fidget factor there, and the only things that I can I can complain about are so minuscule. Um, this is a winner. I think this is really cool, and I'm really excited to see this um, become available. So check out that mailing list uh, down in my description. Um, let me know what you guys think. I'm always excited to hear what you guys think. And give uh, Blade Banter a follow on Instagram, absolutely. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make a card. It's exactly how it sounds, and it's, yeah, his logo has two Bs in it. I think it's uh, black and bronze or black and silver. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's an awesome guy. This is an excellent prototype. He obviously knows what he's doing. He had a vision, and it's, uh, it's very near final execution, so that's, that's really cool. Thanks so much for the opportunity. If you guys enjoyed this video or you were at least entertained by it, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody.